yeah, Joel, I heard that um, you got a Gwent code today. Is that right? Oh, no, that was Dave. Sorry. that Yeah, that was Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing we're live right now. <laughs> <laughs> the actual anger. I, the knife isn't even twisting anymore. Like, there's nothing left to twist in. It's just spinning with no resistance. The knife has been twisted so much. I didn't get a code Joel, either, Joel. He's been so angry. Oh. Okay, Jeremiah, the look he gave me this afternoon while trying to play on my account, he's just so frustrated. I look at him, I'm like, okay, don't forget, Joel, that Jeremiah has it up for the beta too. What if he gets a code first and doesn't even use it for like a week? <laughs> no joke. If if looks could kill, he would have killed me for just thinking about that. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> it bothered him. Now so he much. gives you a key, is that a Steam key? Uh, it's a GOG key. Okay, so it just adds it to your GOG galaxy? Mm-hmm. What you doing, Joel? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you you checked, didn't you, Joel? You checked for the code. No, I wasn't checking for a code. <laughs> <laughs> you sound so sad. Wait, let me make, make sure I didn't I, do I told Dave I will freaking buy a damn code for Gwent. Have you looked to see if you can? Actually, no. Let's check. Let's, I just, we're I don't going, trust any of that stuff. We're going right to a shady site right now. We're going to dlcompare.com. Ooh, Gwent. my favorite. Mm, no results. Because I know Gwent. as soon as I buy one, though, I'm going to get a free one. We're going to fall oh, farther man, this, down the rabbit hole. This hey, weight G2A. hurts so much. The weight? It does. I and hate Joel. knowing that Dave is playing Gwen. Joel, <laughs> Even I'm though he's giving time. me free codes for games. <laughs> I love him hard, and hate him. <laughs> I'm having a hard time competing, too. So, like, we're already behind the curve, Joel. Already. I know. I mean, how long is the beta? Until, Until like, like, March. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. So, it's, like, kind of coming out a little bit. It, yeah. It's a closed beta for a few months, and then, I think, open beta. So... Now, if you got the email saying you don't got to do anything, that means we are getting codes, right? At some point, most likely. Okay, because I got that email too, but uh, I haven't seen anything from them yet. It's been a good day. Jeremiah, would you give me your code if you got one? <laughs> <laughs> Look at his face right now. <laughs> My dog makes this face like when you're eating an apple. He's like, "Hey, <laughs> what you what you got there?" I'll, I'll film footage of your car. You already offered to do that. Oh damn it! You're right. <laughs> what you want? <laughs> Honestly, I I don't I had forgotten Gwen was coming out this week. I doubt I haven't really participated in anything. I doubt I'm going to get a code. But it's, if you do, uh, we, we can talk about it then. Check your inbox, Jeremiah. Right now? Check it. What happened? Dave? Check. What are no, you guys doing? I'm, <laughs> no, I'm saying... <laughs> calm down. I'm telling him to look see if he got one yet. Jeez. Oh. <laughs> Joel, you're like having a spaz attack. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I got was Tuesday what? just saying... Uh, uh, I just want to play Gwen. <laughs> The struggle. It's so real. Someone found a um, <laughs> a, basically like a muster glitch for the monsters deck, and filled his side of the board up with so many cards. Each one was like ten pixels wide, like just like the edges. The total score at the end of the game was eight hundred and sixteen to like fifty. <laughs> <laughs> it was insane. Like yeah, there's a few kinks that need ironing out, but I just thought anybody listening to this podcast. If you have a Gwent code, <laughs> Joel will do things yeah. for you, to you. <laughs> 18 and up only, please. <laughs> oh, here's, uh, here's news. If you don't like Gwent, just sign up so I can get a code. So Best Buy and GameStop are doing a midnight launch for Skyrim Special Edition, which is weird because the game is out now. But it is a big game. Right, but like they're doing a midnight launch after the game's already <laughs> out. Like, so you want to go wait in line late at night? Or you could just get the game and go home and play now. Maybe they're not selling it in stores yet. Well, you can't, I, guess, I guess they're not selling it retail yet. Yeah, digitally it's out right now. Although, oh, well, it's out on PC. I'm assuming it's out. No, yeah, okay. No, this I'm guy is saying he was in Walmart. I'm on the PS4 subreddit. He said he was in Walmart three hours ago and Skyrim and Titanfall 2 were out on the shelves already. So Walmart doesn't care. <laughs> 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they make up their own rules. It's crazy. I am more excited to play Skyrim than I ever was when it first came out. Really? I think it. I think it has to do with um, Fallout Four was good, but it just. I don't know. It didn't have that. It didn't have that feel like the other older games. I didn't like the whole like, you know, dialogue choice tree this time around. It's not bad, but it's just like it works really well for Mass Effect, I think, because it feels more like a cinematic experience. Fallout, I just felt like I was way more constricted to like there was not as many hilarious options or different things to choose from in the game. And I really miss like honestly having a silent character in Skyrim like I just liked reading. I, I I think it's just the relaxing music, but I'm really excited to go back in the world and do a whole bunch of quests I've never done before. Mm -hmm. I, since I never really played it that much when it came out because I'd played Sky or I'd played Oblivion within like the last year and a half and stuff. Yeah, I maybe I will try it again. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I will try it again. Hey, you can do the Potato Master stuff with my copy. Thanks. See if you like it. I, I'm, I'm so happy Joel's excited and Debbie's excited, and because everyone's been asking like, Dave, are you gonna play some some Skyrim? I'm like, first of all, first of all, I have Geralt in my heart now. <laughs> <laughs> well, he'll, he'll soon be leaving. My heart. Dave. He'll soon be leaving. Shut up. Shut up. Not but sure. hey, you'll have a he'll lot of never, Gwent campaign. Don't worry about it. You have Gwent he'll campaign. Never leave me, Joel. You liar. You liar. <laughs> where I was going with this. Oh right. But um, You're also. Say mods mods yeah because i i waited a few weeks after the launch to start playing skyrim and i went right to like hd textures and like god rays and post effects and all that stuff ambient occlusion mods that one was that, that helped a lot with like the the ground shadows and all so yeah i, I think the version i played was like probably 80 percent, 85 percent of of the enhanced edition on pc so i mean i got like 190 hours out of the game that was good so you're not thinking you're gonna go back in Oh uh, no, I'm not. Definitely not. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, to me, to me, it's not really necessarily the whole new graphics. I mean, like it's to me, it's like, oh, cool. I can, you know, I played on 360 before, um, and I had it on PC as well. Uh, but I think just because it's been so long, and going from Witcher and some of the parts in Witcher that I wish had like first person, like I'd love to be able to just explore some of the Witcher land in first person to see stuff. But I like it's been such a long time since I played it because I played it right when it was out for like the first three or four months and I kind of did everything or, you know, I got tired of it because I remember I, I think Mass Effect 2 or 3 was around the same time and I was really big into that series. Um, so I think it's just the distance it's been. I'm just excited to try it out again. Like, I feel like I'm in a different mindset now than I was back then mm -hmm. to like play a more relaxing. I just want to be casual, like enjoy the music because i still listen to the soundtrack all the time oh it's I great just yeah like, just do you know writing or whatever it is just because music's so good should we start the podcast and we're just talking yeah about we games? probably should <laughs> yeah, <laughs> i'm just like <laughs> i kind of thought we were i forgot yeah, yeah right. uh, we were having a great skyrim discussion i'm like hey, we were having fun i forgot we were on a podcast <laughs> now we gotta start a, the podcast it's a gaming podcast we should, this is good stuff actually we i'll should. just fold that into the beginning that's all right why don't we okay we could be a little we can be a little different tonight um let's just go ahead and roll right into what are we playing this week <laughs> we'll start the podcast as we always do by editing in the introduction <laughs> later on nah, yeah, I'm, yeah, just, yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna fade right in i don't even care i don't even it's care <laughs> okay <laughs> we casual <laughs> I'm, I'm very right, overworked right now that's oh i, I didn't start the, i got it i gotta start the time now though okay so. that's fine yeah add uh um, add add just five minutes to whatever you write down and it'll be fine Okay. Or no, you I'll write down the real times. I'll add. I'll calculate the time difference and I'll add it when I make okay. the show notes. Boy, is this not uncomplicated? It's not real. I, oh, you're the only person who thinks time codes are this much of a burden, Dave. Every time I ask him, he's like, "I'll go get the sled dogs hooked up." <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to pull out the abacus, and then it just gets really complicated. <laughs> Dave, what have you been playing this week? <clears throat> a freaking lot of Battlefield. I have 34 hours already <laughs> in Battlefield 1. Uh, those lunch breaks have been coming in handy. Um, <laughs> five days of lunch breaks, 34 hours of Battlefield. The, the weeknights. Uh, uh. Okay, so... <laughs> we're talking a lot about Battlefield tonight, so I don't want to sit here for too long, but confession time. Every time that we play for like two hours on a weekday... <laughs> When you guys leave, I play for like another 45 minutes easily every time. Every time. 
<laughs> when you guys left, what was it? Was it two nights ago? Yeah. 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 Me and Daniel just got like we we logged off a of Teamspeak, and I was like, Daniel is still in my squad in game. It's like, I wonder if I keep playing if he'll just keep playing. And we both just played for like another forty minutes with just no no comms in game. It was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, I definitely have the uh, the wrong document up, but um, gosh, what else have I been playing? You it's said, been a lot of Battlefield. You like said it. you were approaching the end of Blood and Wine and the Gwent beta. That's what you had written down. Thank you. Um, yeah, I am, as I expected, very very close to the end of uh, Blood and Wine. Joel said that he he got past it, so um. Tell me where I am, basically. Um, absolutely loving it. I think I'm going to actually load a save and go back, because I apparently missed a few treasures in the fantasy part of the world. Um, as if the whole game's not fantasy. The super fantasy part of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <it> <laughs> the ridiculous fantasy. Um, and then Gwent came out today. I've only played like 30 minutes total. Um, maybe 45. Cause it, yeah, it's about five matches worth, so about 45 minutes. How much? Uh, how much have you played, Joel? I I try okay, I installed Parallels. I installed mother effing Windows 10 in Parallels on my Mac to be able to Which, play it. Is is and, that the student is that the student version, Joel? What? Like, mother effing Windows 10 is that like the student discount version? No, it's just it's just a trial. Like mm -hmm. Windows 10, you can install it and you can use it for a little while. Cool. Yeah, I, that, I literally that's, that's some that's some bold marketing from Microsoft. Yeah, I know. Um <laughs> <laughs> and it could run it, but like it, it had a hard time. Like it, it, it would run well if it was on boot camp, but trying to run it both at the same time. I think Windows 10 uh, memory uh, requirement. I think I have four or six gigs in my MacBook Air. So it's right at that limit where it's like, ah, this is not going to be a great experience. And then I tried playing a couple games and every single time because the Wi-Fi was connection. I think I'm guessing it was a Wi-Fi. It might work at my home, but um, it kept disconnecting. And forcing the partner to like the other person playing to cancel. So what I actually kept winning. I would win the round and I kept winning scraps for day, but I didn't get to actually play anything. I just. Oh, you have some scraps? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Like I heard you like 30 Ooh. scraps or whatever the heck oh, that is. Oh, that's nothing. <sighs> Don't bring those tawdry through, rags. <laughs> I'm looking through Skype right now for the code just to get it downloaded on my system. What else have you been playing, so, Joel? Oh, sorry, Dave. We're, we're talking about uh, Dave right now. Yeah, I was just going to say a few things about Gwen. Um the visually the game is beautifully polished they added some uh, some more of the side banners kind of like the actual cards to make them look less like digital cards they kind of have like that ribbon down the side now i love the art style um the audio and music fantastic uh a few balance issues but less than i was actually expecting i am doing a lot worse than i was expecting out of five games of only one two uh mainly because it's a couple of of really bad typos and in gwent like a typo where a card does not do what you expect it to do, like you like, like waste a card, that can cost you the whole game right there because it can come down to like one card play for the entire uh, game. So um, overall, I mean, I I knew it was going to be good, but I, I'm very impressed. I'm sad that Nilfgaard is not in the game yet because that's my faction, but it's, it is coming. Um, I'm also a little bit sad that there are microtransactions already in the closed beta. You can buy kegs of cards, uh, two bucks a piece, it's like seven pack for 10 bucks. Um, you can, of course, you know, for your play, you can unlock all those those kegs, but it will take a bit of a grind. So I imagine for me, it won't take long. Um, but I, if it were any other developer, I'd be super worried about balance. And some people are saying that people who are dropping like 200 bucks on kegs right now, and there are a number of those people already, um, are having an out-of-gate advantage in the first few days. Even with the random number generator and the skill stuff where, you know, what you play does matter. <clears throat> so what I'm, I'm hoping to see is over the next couple weeks where people who are just grinding the game can kind of catch up just a bit, um, I'm hoping to see things balance out a bit. And I, I hope that the chasing after the microtransactions does not damage the core gameplay. And also, uh, Joel has kind of been worried about the amount of new effects cards because compared to the base game, there is a wild amount of effects cards that do things to certain types of units, and there's, there's so much new stuff to learn. And with five uh, factions confirmed now, there's a danger of ending up with, like, instead of the 216 or whatever cards in the original game, there's a danger of having, like, 800 cards you gotta learn all of a sudden, which would be a bit of a mess. So I'm hoping that what we are seeing card-wise is like 
it that we're not going to see like every six months 50 new cards coming out because it's already a lot um the sad part is is because they do have the buy cards that's not it's not like you're going to buy cards and all of a sudden at one point they're just going to go away and go oh there's no new cards to buy you know like if it was if it was one thing of going hey it's a free game if you'd like to buy all the cards and you have your whole collection it's 60 bucks or you can buy a dollar and you can get a couple cards at a time but because it's you can buy kegs that unlock random cards at any time it's random yeah they want this game to last there's going to be a shit ton of cards and so for me i'm i could care less about actually the money because i will give a lot of money to play Gwent because i love the game what i'm more worried about is honestly just being it being competitive because once you have so many cards the game loses your ability to predict any kind of ability because it's going to turn into deathmatch i think where you spawn in and some could be right behind you where there is no skill they're just going to kill you it's just luck of the draw and i think gwent has a very good luck of the draw where it's 20 percent luck 80 percent skill yeah yeah I agree. so i haven't played much again because i don't have the key but i've watched some footage and i've seen dave play and so again i hope they you know it's obviously in beta so we're going to learn a lot from it but i just hope uh it doesn't turn into that because that'll I'll, that'll be sad at least we have real gwent dave if, if <laughs> oh, that, that superior tone. But yeah, that's what I've been playing this week. Cool. Joel, you and I have been playing Dark Soul 3, Ashes of Ariandel, or Ariandel. S- Ariandel. Singular? Just, just, just one Dark Soul 3? Dark Soul 3. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a Chinese a Dark Soul. A Dark Soul 3. <laughs> Now, uh, Mark and I hopped on last night, and we played. We beat the whole thing in two and a half hours, and I did go look at a guide just to make sure, and we really did see, like, we saw it all. We saw... It's really only one area, a couple big areas within that area. Um, there's two bosses, one additional humanoid-type boss, and that was it. So, I this is my first From Software DLC I've played, so Joel... Uh, what are your thoughts before I give mine? Because you know more about it than I do. Uh, I mean, I'm loving it. It's a really cool new area. Um, I'm loving the new enemies. I'm excited to get to the point where I can do the... There's like a 3v3 duel thing where you can jump in from just... Any, I think any bonfire or the main bonfire um, and just quickly jump in without having to use, I think, embers or anything. Just kind of like a multiplayer, um, you know, duke it out thing. So I'm excited for a lot of it. Like, yeah, me and John, we've been, we've been having a lot of fun. I'm about seven and a half hours in. We're like collecting every item, killing every last little thing. <laughs> it's fun. But nice. uh, yeah, I, I think it sucks that the next DLC is still going to be in the spring. Like, it's nice knowing that there's going to be more like Dark Souls until it's all done, because they said this is supposed to be the last one, at least in the Dark Souls series. Uh, so I'm kind of savoring it. <laughs> yeah, you, you said seven hours in. Like, I know I'm not going to be playing PvP, so that will... That will reduce some time, but yeah. I didn't feel like we blazed through it that quickly, and still it doesn't feel like it feels like this is way too little content for fifteen bucks. And I was reading on the Dark Souls subreddit, uh, and apparently this is actually kind of par for the course for a lot of their DLC. Not Bloodborne. Apparently, Bloodborne was like two DLCs that got combined and released as one, and that was actually pretty meaty. Um, but is hmm. this about the same length as previous Dark Souls DLCs? Uh, Dark Souls 2 DLC, um, the first one, it's pretty much one, one zone. Um, yeah, and there was three of them, so there's three zones. So all three of them, it was, it was pretty long. Uh, I mean, the Dark Souls 1 or 2 DLC, the first one might have been, maybe it's like a tad longer. Again, I haven't beat it, but this is around the same amount of time as I, I played the last one, so. Okay. Well, I thought the area was pretty cool. Um, I really liked the end boss. It wasn't that hard, but it was really unique. Like the art design and everything were um, really interesting and it was really pretty. So I appreciate all the work they put into that. A lot of the enemies seem like just generic big guys, uh, but there is one particular section that has really cool enemies. There's these cool like skeleton bird things that squelch around on the ground and they're suitably creepy. And then there's, have you been to the underground section yet, Joel? Uh, I think I'm about to head there. Okay, so I won't I won't spoil it, but there's like one pretty nasty pl- section you run through that feels like, actually feels like the most bloodborne like of anything there, um, and I, I really like that section too, although it was pretty short, but yeah, it was fun. Uh, it just feels like, again, I haven't played that much Dark Souls DLC, so maybe this is just normal, and they expect you to grind some of it, 
like you know grind it over and over for different uh i don't know perks and weapons and yeah. whatever well you beat dark souls 2 what in 14 hours dark souls 2 uh yeah. like 60 no 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 three dark souls, uh, dark souls three three yeah you're like, no, you're like uh, 14 hours no it was like so, i mean, you uh, I mean it, it was like uh 18 hours yeah depending how you play i mean it could be it could be short again every dark souls game people don't realize this but you can run through every level like every single level you can beat it super fast <laughs> all you have to do is just run and you and you can run past enemies but you know if again if you go the wrong way you're going to get effed but once right. you know where to go you can literally just run through stuff so people kind of forget that no that's part like for most people like you want to kill all the bosses you want to kill all the enemies so that's part of the challenge too but if you just want to beat it you can just run through it so it kind of depends on how you play i am at 14 hours in dark souls 3 and i just got to the swamps I'm excited to play it again with Dave whenever he gets a moment. Yeah, that that's going to be a good decade. I'm, I think it's <laughs> it's a great way to just start things out. I think out. once you finally finish Witcher and you're finished, you know, with the main story stuff in Fallout, I think you'll be able to have time to play it. Well, until Battlefield came out. <laughs> yeah. Joel, what else have you been playing? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> uh, finished up the main quest in uh, Blood and Wine, Witcher. I have the Bioshock collection. I'm playing through one. I'm like halfway through. Ugh, love it. It's just been a blast. Oh, how's uh, that look now, Joel? With like all the new oh, artifacts stu- and all. I love it. Like it looks awesome. I'm just really, really <laughs> look at your it. face. Oh, it's- I do. Like I love the first, the first Bioshock. <laughs> nice. And oh yeah, I absolutely. found out. I don't know if Jeremiah, if you've played this before, but there's a DLC for Bioshock Two called Minerva's Den. Yeah. I never heard of it. So never apparently, I was re- no. Oh. I, I I knew there was a multiplayer thing. For it so i always thought that's what it was well anyways i find out online people are saying it's the best dlc of all bioshocks like the story is phenomenal people say that about infinite as well but, but still DLC. i mean mm-hmm. if it's anywhere good to any of those yeah, it's, yeah. i'm real. i'm like oh cool an actual new bioshock story so i'm playing through everything to, to do cool. that i'm not necessarily playing through infinite but i'm playing through bioshock one and two Gosh, Joel, you just reminded me. I I have that dlc now like i have all the dlcs yeah. for the the reunion edition i forgot i had them <laughs> and then I'm uh, I'm playing uh, Here They Lie on PSVR. Oh man, I am loving it. Like Here They Lie is amazing. There's there's a part in it after 30 minutes in that I, I can't wait for you guys to experience. But you just come out of a metro underground metro sub tunnel, and you come out, and it's just it. I mean, it, it, honestly, it looks like a apocalyptic area of downtown Fallout 4. And you're just everything's blowing in the wind and it just feels huge. It's probably the most like coolest thing I've seen in VR so far. That just mm. I think just because I think it connected because like I've been out, you know, I've come out of stairs from a metro, you know, before. So it's like it's, it was familiar. But seeing it in VR like it, if I really felt there. And then you have the creepy creatures crawling around. And you're just like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's it's really, really good. I'm like probably three or four hours into the game. Cool. And uh, we're going to be talking about PSVR as a reminder next week for our main topic. So, Dave, we need to try to get you over to Joel's house to play some PSVR. Uh, Ooh, I may have time next week, actually, because I'm finishing that stupid room this weekend. Uh, Yeah, we're going to talk about PSVR and review that next week. But this week, we're reviewing Battlefield 1. But before we get to that, this is Casual Shanigans Gaming, a podcast all about the irreverent love of gaming. I'm one of your hosts, Jeremiah. Tonight, I am joined by Joel... Hey guys. And Dave. Hi. I'm also one of the people that have been talking for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got to do it. I can't deviate from the script, guys. I, I, I wouldn't know where to go from there. Uh, but tonight we're going to review Battlefield 1. And if you've watched any of our reviews, you know they're they're fairly laid back and we don't really have a structure. We're just going to talk about the game a lot. Do we even call these reviews No, it's called What We Think About Battlefield 1. <clears throat> we're just going to tell you what we think. We need to come up with a name for these, because... It's called What We Think About... Nah, we don't ca- really have a name. Casual Thoughts on Battlefield 1. Mm, mm, that's not terrible. <laughs> don't, don't you give me that look and then steal my idea. So anyway, let's hop right in. Now, we have had a variety of things to say about Battlefield 1, both positively and negatively, or about the Battlefield series as a whole over the past couple years. Right. So, for anyone who doesn't know, we are all big previous Battlefield players. Um, not all of us have been to London to defend America uh, against the Queen in Battlefield. Dave alone has that distinction. But uh, 
We've all been playing Battlefield for many, many years. We've played all the games in the series. I think it's pretty safe to say. I mean, I don't know if I played Viet. I don't think I played Vietnam. But between us, we've played yeah. pretty much every single game in the series. Yeah. Uh, we have lots and lots of time into it. That's actually how this gaming group got together. Was Battlefield Three and Daisy were the were the genesis yep. of this gaming group. So I wouldn't be friends with Joel probably if it wasn't for Battlefield Three. Yeah. With that in mind, <laughs> you were so close to missing out. <laughs> and so close to uh, being free. <laughs> so with that in mind, we've like, had a why lot. Why did of... I have to buy that premium edition? <laughs> <laughs> premium friendship. <laughs> All right, we're gonna hop right in. We're gonna start with multiplayer gameplay first because that's the thing that most people are buying Battlefield to play. That's the thing most people are interested in, and that's where we're gonna spend most of our time. So the floor is open. Multiplayer gameplay in Battlefield One. Did they do it? Holy shit, yes. <laughs> Personally, it has been the best like like war shooter I've played in forever. Like it's I wouldn't say it's not as polished as The Last of Us multiplayer. I think that is honestly the best multiplayer I've played in the last like 20 years just as a polished cohesive thing. Okay. But this like as Battlefield is a huge huge game that looks yeah. phenomenal. Oh, yeah. It, to me, it plays like a dream. It really does. The weapons handle awesome. Like, it's not confusing. They really updated, like, you know, I don't know, just how to get around on the map. The vehicles are fun. They're not stupid freaking cars like Hardline and Battlefield 4 where they all just chugged around and they just bopped in here and the tanks. I don't know. It was just, it was horrible. But this is just, like, everything I'm just enjoying. Like, every bit of it. I've not had, like, a complaint where I'm like, oh, man, I got to do this or I got to be a medic or I got to like I'm just enjoying every little bit of it like the destruction like it just works really well like that yeah I know there's little like cracks and problems here there but like for me it's just hard to see them right now because from going from enjoying Battlefield 3 a lot to <laughs> Battlefield 4 just being just just garbage for me like I hated it it sucked that mm, I didn't yeah. get to play I had to like 21 hours in it total you know, for over two and a half years yeah, or something like that. What, what really sucked was that part where I gave you a free copy and then you played seven hours in yeah. five years. <laughs> you, gave me, you gave me the premium. <laughs> <laughs> but this one, Dave, I'm going to make it up. I'll make it up to you because this one, I, I seriously, I want to play. Every time you're like, hey, do you want to play? I really want to play this game. Like, oh, it's yeah. not, I'm not and dreading it. Joel, I, I saw a review. I, I wish I could remember which one it was that described... Battlefield 1 as the most battlefield feeling battlefield game since 1942 the original that classic like multiplayer um cuz you know the original concept for battlefield is like you're you're playing you're playing army with all your friends in the backyard but it's 64 of them and there's vehicles <laughs> like it's just it's kind of like the realization of what games can be uh, as far as just like war games you know and it's going back to the world war one setting i'm glad that they did their own take on it because i'm i don't think it needs to be trench warfare i would still love to see some alternate like hardcore modes and we're supposed to be getting that soon but as far as the the multiplayer as it is out of the box i accept it as is and i am having a blast in it i'd love to see more options um, maybe like a bolt action rifles only mode. They've got the fog of war mode coming out. Hardcore mode is coming. I'm excited for all of that. But if none of that was coming, I'd be okay with it. The multiplayer is so polished and so much fun. Uh, I agree with you guys. I think it's I think it's one of the most polished ones in a while. Partially helped by the launch. Um, it launched fairly smoothly, and maybe that was their plan with doing the origin access buy it early edition whatever maybe that's what they, i said to dave i they figured to do a actually that was roll, a slowly a yeah mm -hmm. i i think it's a scummy business practice in general um i wouldn't have paid extra to do it but since i already had origin access it was kind of like why not but if that did help them have launch week go smoothly i guess that's a good thing maybe i mean maybe that was their plan all along maybe it just worked out that way uh but from day one it was uh it worked really well with except for some issues which we'll get into later of course but yeah i, I think I, I still have some issues with some of the maps um i think sinai desert you know i had a lot of things to say about the the map balance of sinai desert for conquest in the beta i think that actually might be one of the worst ones and there's that one what's it called dave that's like one straight line suez canal it's, suez it's, canal. it's conquest small style that's yeah. my least favorite map because of the the train like when the train's out 
and mm. one team's a little overpowered, you can't do anything on that map. Like, that map, to me, is a throwaway when private servers come out. I think that map's going to fall off so quickly. Because if you want to play that, you're going to play Sinai. Like, they're so similar in their style that why wouldn't you just play Sinai? And well, If I can do a quick aside here. Yeah. Um, I think you actually nailed it there with the the train and uh, the overpowered balance being one of the biggest issues with that map. Because this is the first Battlefield game I think I've ever played where I actually love all the maps. And even Suez, I love it. One of the first ones that Joel and I played during early access. But it's because there was no train. The match was super close and it was all city combat. And Joel and I are just like dodging mortar fire. The buildings are exploding. We're like bayonet Wait, charging are we, alleyways. Are we talking about the one that's like kind of like a whole ruined city? Yeah, no, no, no. That's that. That's that's uh, that's a means. That's a Western Front. It's a it's a Middle Eastern. Uh, it's the Suez Canal. Joel it has the burning battleship. Has the all the adobe houses. Very small map and oh, like mode. the desert looking one. Yeah, very small yeah. desert map. Oh, I it's love that one. Only three flags. I I think Jeremiah is right. When the train shows up, it can be ruined. But I still loved it when it was just. The infantry combat. I think it has the potential to even be a really good map. Even that being, I think Jeremiah's right. One of the not as good ones. And you know, I also I don't I don't love that they kind of played fast and loose with history when it comes to the guns. Like they found any prototype weapon that was <laughs> fully automatic and somehow found a way to get into the game. I wish they would have pulled back from that because actually I think the bolt actions and the shotguns and everything are really good. And I think those are the strongest weapons as far as the game's balance goes. And I like playing with them. You know, one of the issues with Battlefield 4, besides all the desync and the problems, was people were just nailing you. Like, you get up in the chopper, 15 rockets out of nowhere. Like, you run across the map, snipers out of nowhere. Like, there was always people just nailing you from any distance, and the guns were really good. They were all really good. All 250 guns were amazing. Um, and Battlefield That was just one, one class. That was yeah. just one class. They've, they've paired it back. Weapons. That's not counting the camo <laughs> either. But they've paired it back with Battlefield 1, which I appreciate because I think stripping it down makes it better. But I think they could have stripped it down a little bit farther even. Um, and, and I wish they would have pulled back. So maybe some classes could only have bolt action or only have some basic slow semi-automatic rifles. Because I think that's actually when the gameplay is strongest. But I like that you can be in a big engagement and you're not that far away from the other team. And everybody's fighting, but you're not getting laid out immediately. Like, you can throw down health packs, you can throw down ammo mm -hmm. packs, you're, you're reloading a lot. You reload so much. Because, I love that, yeah. But, but it's another thing that balances it out. And so I don't know how much this was intentional and how much it just worked out because of the time period. Uh, but, you know, I think it feels more like World War II than World War I, just with a lot of the guns and stuff and the prevalence of tanks and everything. But I understand it's very late World War I is what they're going for. So I understand that. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I think they did kind of luck into pretty well balanced now we've only really been playing with squads for most of the stuff we've done uh um, speak for yourself <laughs> well, that's true. we have a squad of five people i mean the the squad thing really does work now um we were uh, all the nights we've played where there's been like a group of four or five people playing together i mean you just wreck shop like it's not even close you pretty much run the board you run the flags unless your team is complete glue sniffers you have a very good chance of winning yeah. And uh, and it's a ton of fun. It's a lot more fun than Battlefield 4 was. So I guess a lot of the things I'm excited about are that I'm excited about Battlefield again. Yeah. So yeah. I wouldn't say, like, I think Battlefield 3 was really good. It had a bad launch. It, all, it did have some issues, but we put a lot of time into Battlefield 3, and we liked Battlefield 3. So I don't know if I'm ready to say that, like, the raw gameplay experience of Battlefield 1 is significantly better than Battlefield 3, but being just as good as Battlefield 3 would be great and i think it's definitely just as good as battlefield 3 and i think the novel setting that we don't really see in games yeah kind of elevates the overall experience to where i'm really enjoying it because it could be another modern shooter that was just as good as battlefield 3 and i know i would be more bored because like i've played this a hundred times already and i'm not that interested but yeah i like that um so that's the gameplay let's i mean we're gonna be talking about gameplay for a lot of the rest of this too but maps let's focus on maps really briefly uh, there's going to be DLC maps, of course, but I agree yes. with you. I think the the overall maps are pretty solid. Like Sinai, you know, I think some of the points are kind of useless. Uh, for some of the maps, there's a point or two that does feel kind of thrown in, but I think Sinai mm -hmm. is one of the weakest. Sinai and Suez are, are some of the weakest, and then most yeah. of the rest of them are pretty decent. 
when I first hopped into Monte Grappa, the one in the Alps, like my jaw dropped. I, that I, I, that's a pretty map. That's really pretty. That the vistas are stunning. I'm like, not only is it stunning vistas, it, like visually, it's amazing, but it's classic battlefield. They didn't make it this tiny little area. It's a huge map where you're fighting up and down the hill. Like I said, even back in Battlefield Three when it launched, I knew that there were going to be maps where I just didn't play them as much. Like Metro. This was a great rush map, awful conquest map. I've tried a bunch of different modes on all the maps, and I haven't run into one where I'm like, I don't want to play that one again. Mm -hmm. They've all been good, at least good for me. Mm -hmm. I, I like this is the first Battlefield game where I think I actually enjoy all the maps. What about you, Joel? Um, I was gonna mention one thing about that maybe you guys don't like about it, but something that I love about the maps. Um, I actually like the one about the train is every map seems like there's a new challenge for it. Uh, why I hated Battlefield 4's maps was every map was the same. They were literally the exactly the same, and you captured flags the same way as you captured maps or flags on the last map. This one feels like you really have to change tactics, and it's the first time I've ever played a game in Battlefield that I feel like if I die, I understand, okay, I should change to this, I should change to this, and that mm. will make more sense. The reason why I love the train, and I like when it gets just when he just wrecks you, because it goes, all right, shit, I can't capture this flag anymore because that train's gonna destroy you. We have to change our tactics and go capture a flag that's totally different. To me, I like it because what ended up happening in Battlefield 4, the times I played, and in 3 towards the end, was we did the same thing every single time. Joel, go over here. We're getting this one flag. We're getting this one. They're all in a straight line. This one's like in that giant desert map with the one far at the end. I love that because it's kind of like, you know what? We're dying. Let's get out there. We'll hold that yeah. one for a while. Get some points. I like that you makes you have to travel. Actually, you have to use your planes. You have to use the Jeeps. Battlefield 4 is like, shit, you don't need any vehicles. Everything's so freaking close. And it's just it's just yeah. grenade fest. This one feels like, actually, I love hearing the train come like, oh, shit, they're going to kill us. I like that. I like the change of pace. It reminds me of playing Gears of War 2 because the maps halfway through the game would completely change. You couldn't be outside. You get effed over by some like smoke thing or bats coming in or something like that. I like how that essentially the train, I think, is their levolution, honestly, for these maps. I love yep. it. Like every map I've just fully enjoyed. I don't even care if I lose or not. Like I'm having so much fun that it just feels like, oh, no, they're going to kill us. Here's our last stand. Like I'm not too worried about like, oh, man, our team's losing. It's just like, oh, I'm going to try to see, see what I'm going to do to get a few more points. Like and to me, it feels like I'm playing a single player cam campaign that's intense. Like, OK, with that. What, what was the one map, Dave? Uh, it's kind of like the the sound of music, like uh, green, grassy Dalps. hills. It's you, Dalps. Yeah, there we go. Well, that's, it's, that's it's, it's called it. it's called Monte Monte Grappa. Yeah, I, I, Monte Grappa. Yeah, I love that one because my two favorite places to capture there. I love the one that's just fully in the open where you're just like, holy crap, this is sucks. And then I love the inside of the tunnel because the people at the top, like it's not just, oh, a hop, skip and jump to go down. You have to actually traverse, make your way through rocks, hide behind mm -hmm. stuff, crawl, and then get there. Like, honestly, I'm like amazed. Like these maps are such a change from the last game. Like it's just, it's unbelievable. Like, last one, I'm like, eh, whatever, buildings, great, windows, glass, breaks. It's like, this one's like, I freaking drove a tank through a building, squashed you guys, blew another tank up, and then like rescued my team. Like, ah, oh, it's so good. Like, I love I, it. Speaking of which, the use of destruction on the maps is so fantastic. It's, it's helpful. Where, it's, it's where you would expect it to be, too. Like, very, very rarely do you try to destroy an object and then you, you can't. Like, their use of destruction, and it, it looks a lot better than previous games. I think it makes more sense tactically. There's only a few places where you're like, oh, that stupid wall won't go away. But yeah, the maps have impressed me so much. Like, the second day, I told Joel, I'm like... Oh, they could tell me that there's going to be five years of, years of DLC for this game, and I would, I'd be so excited because I want more of this. This is all so good. And Dave, speaking the the destruction, I, yeah. I just remember just a quick yeah. little short story. What's so fun about the destruction is you can hear the building getting ready to collapse. So I'm in a building, right? I hear it collapsing. I bust through window. I literally run and do a dive. I dive out and land. I was like, I'm safe. It was just like so cool. I don't know, like it. it 
I, I don't know what how they did it, but like this time around, it just feels like, hey, destruction is useful. Like I could destroy something and then kill someone behind that wall. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to Battlefield 4, it was like everything's blowing up that it was well, just made it hard to see I stuff. I mean, they, they pretty much just went back to like Bad Company 2 and did exactly that destruction just in a much prettier yeah. engine. I mean, that that's really what they did. It's They're not doing anything works. new in regards to that, but it yeah. does work. Yeah. I guess it's just like gameplay wise or mechanics. It's just... It, well, pe- people you understand them, what's going on better, I guess. People have been wanting them to go back to Bad Company 2 Destruction for a while, and I think they just actually did it on this one, and that's the difference. Is pe- This is what people have been saying they wanted, and then yeah, yeah, for sure. guys listened to them this time. But uh, graphics. So, I mean, it's a Frostbite game. Ooh. Battlefront was really good looking last year. Just the shaders and the lighting and everything was extremely impressive, and they kicked it up a notch. I don't think anyone's ever complained that a Battlefield game wasn't good looking. Um, but I think the biggest thing that's been standing out to me is... I'm glad they waited this long to make this game. Yeah. To make this World hey, War game. Yeah. Because if they made this eight or nine years ago, it wouldn't have been this good. And if they made it even like three or four years ago, it coming mm. right off of Battlefield wow. 3, it might not have been this good. That's a good point. But since they kind of fell in the dirt a little bit and picked themselves back up, the graphics engine kind of intersected along with DICE maybe learning some hard lessons as a company. And... The chaos of war, however you want to describe it, besides levolution, um, <laughs> the chaos of war is kind of nuts. There are times where it's pure insanity, like because there's smoke everywhere, smoke everywhere, fire everywhere. Somebody tosses a gas grenade. You're trying to like keep all your squad mates up. People are dying right and left, you know. And then you see fire like cutting through the smoke. Someone's coming in with a flamethrower. Your building blows up. Like there, I've saved a couple shadow play clips where I go back and watch it. And I'm like I have no idea even what's happening right now. Just everybody's screaming and trying to revive and trying to get to a point and trying to hold it. And it's just chaos. And the engine is a big part of that. Um, cause the destruction is just happening all of the time. There's just it feels stuff natural, happening. pretty natural. Like, yeah. The, the, the yeah. battle feels like it's, it looks so real because the way that the maps react to the combat feels really, really good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The amount of times I've seen like Dave fly over, bombing air, like calling in Dave for like a uh, for a bombing run is just so mm. bad. It really is. It's so <laughs> badass because Dave's really good at flying. He's like is... goes over me, drops the bombs. I see guys that literally go and like flip out over a bridge. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> this is the first battle. Like, you get your rifle, like yeah. If anyone's ever seen the movie Empire of the Sun with Christian Bale as a Spielberg movie, there's this music that like plays, and Christian Bale's like yeah, and, like planes are, like flying over. That's exactly how I feel. <laughs> uh, I think this is the first battlefield game where I um I'll get back to the graphics in just a second, but where I think the planes actually contribute. And I know I give you lots of grief about flying planes, Dave, but in this one, like you can actually stay up in the plane for a while, so that's a new one. <laughs> Uh, I've always pe- been able to do that. No, I know. On. <laughs> well, I'm saying people, you're, you're not spinning, but you would spend half your time running away from lock-ons and fighting yes, them jets and planes and stuff. Yeah. In this one, it feels like I can actually support the team on the ground, which in theory is what the aircraft are supposed to be doing, which, you know, in a lot of Battlefield games, all the snipers fought all the other snipers and the aircraft fought all the other aircraft and 15 people played the objective. <laughs> and that was kind of like actual war. <laughs> like uh, They have tanks, so we have tanks. They have snipers, so we have snipers. They have planes, well, now we got planes. <laughs> but uh, I've actually been able to do good stuff in the planes. Like, I had a streak last night where I was actually killing people and flying around and spotting people with the flare. My only gripe I think I have about the planes is get rid of the parachutes. Don't let people use them as a taxi. Like I've actually not seen that at all in Battlefield 1 yet. At all. I've, I've definitely... I mean, I've seen I've it just because I personally said, Dave, fly me over this, and I yeah. parachute right into, like, fire. Oh, well, that, that, that doesn't count. Taxi means when, when the driver oh, okay. takes a vehicle to taxi. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Still, um, I think they should get rid of it. Just make it like, no, you're in the plane, you're in the plane, or you die. I forgot to see you the clip, Jeremiah. I sent it to, to John, but there was a guy who was in a fighter chasing a, a bomber, and he blew up the bomber... And like it starts to spin out, and the pilot explodes. The ragdolls in this game are awesome. Pilot explodes out of the cockpit. You hear him go, ah, like this scream as he falls out of the cockpit. And then he slams into the struts on the guy's wing, ragdolls around the struts, and it's just hanging there, flopping in the wind. And the guy's like, mm, like damaged his plane <laughs> some, so it's kind of like some debris fell off. And then he's like trying to like shake the guy's ragdoll off. The guy's like stuck in the strut. It's like, mm. it's like. How is this game sinking that ragdoll? That looks ridiculous. 
going but back graphics, to yeah graphics going back to, to graphics and the maps too actually um i like your mind how you described it as this was the right time to make this game and as part of that we got a feature in the maps and graphics that we've been wanting in a battlefield game since the beginning dynamic weather and it's not just oh this map can have fog it's literally every map could have the different kinds of storms fog rain and it's different levels of that weather effect and it's randomized on how long it is when it happens it makes the maps feel so fresh like the city map a means in the fog feels so different from like the bright sunny version or the rainy version um and even some of the desert maps have like a light sandstorm that can happen it's like light medium and then heavy where there can be a sandstorm where the planes can still like see targets in the ground you can still see where you're driving and stuff like that but it's just like a little bit harder to aim at people close to you because there's just like just like a little bit of, of sand just enough to get in the way I still have somewhere my list of like wanted features for Battlefield 3 before it came out and one of them the top ones was like actually dynamic weather effects and now we have it and it's awesome Joel any other thoughts about the graphics there's been a multiple times where Dave and I um, I forget what map it is, Dave, but it's it's one of the first beta or closed beta ones where there's a lot of trenches and mud Saint and everything. St. Quentin's Scar. Yeah. Uh, where Dave and I, we flanked way to the right. And you can go really far into the kind of no man's land area. And we're just crawling in the mud and the guns are getting all muddy and stuff like that. It was, again, like, I mean, I have not had this much fun and have wanted to actually play a game like this for a long time because... Battlefield 4 always just felt so unbalanced where it's like the second you spawn in, you get shredded by a machine gun or a chopper or some. There were so many weapons, it was just hard to keep track of what each one did, especially for me. Like, I just have a hard time keeping track of a million weapons, you know? Yeah, yeah. Dave, Dave is amazing at these games, and he could figure it all out. I just have a hard time, especially if I don't play 100 hours of it. I'm never well, going to figure it out. I'm the same you know? way, Joel, in most games. Battlefield is just my thing. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, exactly. In Titanfall, I'm yeah. not going to know all the weapons. Yeah. But, but this game... It's like, okay, I know no one is going to be able to track me via a radar, you know, or like via, you know, like a r easy sh shoot rockets. So like, I feel like I'm on the same label level with a lot of people. So it's like, I actually feel like I can flank and I can, I, I don't know. It's just maybe because I'm able to play a little better. And I've always loved, you know, stuff about World War One, learning about it. And, you know, it's just the graphics are just phenomenal. I'm just, I'm loving it because seeing what they did with Battlefront. You know, and using the like photo textures or whatever, like to mm. everything, all the dirt, like just looks really fun to play in in the game. So while yeah, we're on the subject of it. graphics, uh, I didn't have the potato masher video ready to be inserted into the podcast tonight. Uh, but by the time this video goes live Monday morning, it should be live on my channel if everything goes well with the edit. Cool. Uh, I'm working on that now. So I wanted to make a, a side note about that. The game is extremely demanding. If you haven't bought it yet and you're not sure. Uh, some people think it's a bug right now. It might just be the game being this this hard on hardware, uh, but CPUs are getting murdered in this game. Um, the first night, mine was at almost a hundred percent. It's tapered off from there, so I don't. Maybe the day one patch did something. Who knows? Uh, I'll have to see what mine is. It doesn't mine weird runs my, really well. I, I feel yeah, like my, it's not my hex any core is doing just fine with the, it, uh, the twelve it's, threads and the six cores. It's, mm, it's just mm. it's totally it's David just doesn't count. Along. Doesn't count. Just it's it's trimmed down a bit. Uh, but their minimum CPU is an a sixty six hundred K. Ooh, like the current gen quad core or an FX uh, sixty three fifty, which is a uh, a hexacore on an architecture from two thousand twelve. So I, I have no idea what that plan was. Uh, but it's decent. So on the masher, this is just spoilers uh, for anybody who is going to be watching this. Go check the video out on my channel uh, once the finished podcast goes live, if you're interested. But it is a game I would play on PC for a variety of reasons. The main one being the PS4 in multiplayer is not great right now. It chugs really hard. Digital Foundry put out their big analysis of it, and the game is getting down to 30 FPS semi-often. And it's averaging 40s. Um, so it can hit 60 FPS, but it doesn't very often. Like, it's very, very rare that it hits that. And when I was recording footage with no frame rate counter on the PS4, when I was recording for the Potato Masher video, the whole time I was thinking, like, this just doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel good. Something's wrong. And it turns out what I was feeling was very, very low FPS. It's got motion blur and stuff that, um, like, it, the actual experience isn't super choppy. Like, they, it's got really good motion blur, the game's really pretty, they smooth all that out, there's not a lot of screen tearing or anything, so, like, that part of the experience is good, but the frame rate chugs, so the input lag is just bad, 
and the overall speed and energy of the players on PS4 is nowhere close to the P- PC version. So if you're looking to just dip your toes in and you're not ready for the grind fest, then I mean, maybe you would like it better. But as of right now, if you have a budget PC, I would try to do. I don't know if any of those trials of Battlefield are still happening. Are they, Dave? Like, can you still use Origin Access and play it for 10 hours? Yeah. Okay, then I would do that if you're on PC and make sure your hardware can run it first because it's very demanding. It scales well, but it's demanding. And if you're on PS4, I would try to rent it first, honestly. Because especially if you're a big Battlefield fan, you might be disappointed by this because it runs a lot worse than Battlefront did, uh, which was pretty perfect on PS4. Um, And it runs worse than Battlefield 4 did as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, But now... Let's move on to sound. Uh, I rated it a 10. It's phenomenal. It's a dice game. It's mm. man. I think the only game that beats it sound wise probably has to be Far Cry 4. <laughs> For some reason, Far Cry 4 had like phenomenal mm. gun sounds. Mm. They just sound so meaty. But the, thing, but the thing is, it's so different. Like these are totally different games. You don't want gun sounds that crazy in a game like this when you're literally shooting a billion times a second. It's just yeah. you gotta you gotta have different sound design, but it's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't really have any complaints. Uh, I tried out the War Tapes, which is always what I used to play on on Bad Company Two. I don't think War Tapes is quite as good as it used to be, or I'm just a little pickier and don't like it as much as I used to. Uh, but they've got more options for large speaker, small speaker, medium speaker. I don't know if they have medium speaker. It might just be large speaker, small speaker, headphones. Um, they've got a lot more options than they used to. It actually has support for Dolby Atmos. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. That's new surround sound, Dave, uh, where it's not just side channels, it's vertical channels. Ooh. So Dolby Atmos and DTS-X is another thing. Has uh, You have speakers in the ceiling or aimed to reflect sound off the ceiling, and supposedly it adds a nice layer of immersion to it. So EA is going to be supporting that, and Microsoft actually talked at the press conference the other day. They're going to be supporting Atmos or vertical sound and a lot more things. Uh, and... Yeah, it's really cool that it, it supports some forward-thinking technology like that. But no complaints there. Uh, the UI, let's talk about that next. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, we, we got to talk about bad stuff at some point, guys. It, it looks the UI pretty. is the worst in, part of the game. Yeah. <laughs> it looks yeah, it, pretty. Yeah, in-game, in-game when you're playing, it's not bad. Um, like, actually playing. When you're switching between weapons and stuff like that, things just feel too small. Like, they don't need to be... It's weird. Like it's like some parts are really minimal that are like eh, you could actually make it a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit bigger, a little bit easier to use. Um, the main menu of the system just feels garbage. It just feels like such a newsy blog. <laughs> like I don't like that. But I mean, it was really pretty when we saw it for Battlefront. But I think like, they they forgot somewhere the along Battlefront the Battlefront menu works really really well, and I wish they mm-hmm. had that. This one doesn't have the Battlefront menu. It has like a weird it, Xbox it looks, 360 like. It new looks menu. almost exactly like the Battlefront menu, but I think the thing, and so we're graphic designers, so we're going to be a little yeah. pickier on this. <laughs> There's a difference between a pretty looking UI and a well designed UI. And Battlefield yeah, right. 1 does not have a well designed. Like the squads, oh, cool, got these. You know, they're all listed right there. Oh, but they're pop out accordions. Oh, and you can't double click on a squad to join it. You have to click the little plus next to it. Oh, and the party system doesn't really work and you're not really sure what that means. And you click the oh. plus and not all your friends are online and you can't find the button to let you quit the game. Where's the button that lets you quit the game? <laughs> Every time that we're all on a squad and it, it like adds us to the game and there's like a few spots open, right? Like, oh, I'll make the squad public. I hit the minus sign to leave the squad every single time because <laughs> you have to be on the right screen to see the set public. Like if you're on the main initial join screen, you can't see the set public button. The only button to hit is the minus button. I was like, oh, set, you know, uh, unlock it. Right. Oh, no. Uh, now Joel's a squad leader. I'm never getting points for squad stuff, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, like when you're in a tank or something, you see people's names pop up on the side like that all looks good, clear, easy to read. Everything that's happening in game is pretty clear and easy to read other than the weird little icons over on the side. One of them is probably desync. One of them is probably FPS. One of them is a random warning of some kind that we're not really sure about. Packet loss, I think. Okay. What's the difference between that and desync? Packet loss is stuff's actually getting lost. Desync is you you're you're getting the information, but it's not lined up correctly. I mean, no, I understand the difference, like, in the real world. I'm just curious, why is Battlefield telling you 
about the difference while you're playing? Like what, what is, what are you supposed to do with that information? Yeah, I think one of them's a, a ping issue. One of them's a bandwidth issue. I'm not entirely sure on that. Joel, what is your most favorite and least favorite thing about the UI as another designer? Um, what do you, what do you like? What does it do that you think is pretty good? I like the uh, campaign map, the single player campaign map. Like I enjoy mm -hmm. light clicking on that. I mean, it's cool. It's very different. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know if this is, I mean, this is a UI, this is a double UI issue is on PC. It kind of sucks because you do have to mess around with origin. So like when adding a friend, like especially okay, here, I like using controller a lot to play the game. But what's frustrating is you go add a friend, you got to hit start, then it opens up origin UI and you can't use a controller for that segment. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you have on PS4, it is all the same system. You and it's meant to use with the controller, right? So that can be kind of annoying. Even on mouse and keyboard control, it's a frustrating to go because like a little pop up will come over and you go over to click on it. No, you can't click on it. You have to do the shift F1, open the thing, wait for it to load, click join. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, I just, and it's I, it's like a messy looking UI. It's like, can I just all join within the same thing? Like, mm -hmm. do I have do I have to use that to? So I don't know. To me, it's like it just looks messy. But, you know, it's it's working right now and it's it'll hopefully will get better, too. I hope they don't look at this and go, hey, we gave you guys a server browser like you kept asking for. I don't know what you guys are so upset about because <laughs> they made a big deal about they're bringing back a server browser. I'm just curious, like the Steam generic server browser has worked great for, what, 15 years? And it's still just as ugly as when they first, you know, as when they first made it. Like they could have just done that pretty much and it would have been OK. Like, I don't know why they tried to get so fancy with the UI. It wasn't really necessary. Dave knows I hate server browsers. <laughs> And I do. The biggest reason I, it's funny. I, I played tons of original Call of Duty, like the World War One, and I, like, also another reason why I love Battlefield One is because it reminds me of playing uh, Day of Defeat. I played probably 500, 600 hours of that game. I loved it, um, and this the combat really feels like that. Um, but I always hated like server browsers because it to me it always just like I, I love you know it's great to have the freedom to do what you want to do, but for me. Anytime like you see freedom in like multiplayer games, it always means, all right, you jump in a, into a game and the map says it's going to be this, but then the server on the backside actually changed it to this. So like you're never, never know if what you're getting into a legit, like I want to play a standard game, not one that's golden guns only or something, thing, something, you know, <laughs> squirrely like that, which is cool to play. But I feel like that is, is almost does just as bad as having DLC maps where it splits the community where the people who don't mm -hmm. want to buy the DLC maps all of a sudden they can't really play a lot of games, you know, because everyone who bought the DLC is only playing DLC maps. And then the people who own servers are running only the new maps. So now the people who just bought the original game cannot play barely any games with anybody. So I think almost it's, it's, it's just as bad. I think now I, I think, I think PC gaming is totally different from where it used to be too. Even when like, I was talking with Dave about it, like just for communicating with people, it was such a novel thing. Like in the early days, it was so exciting to be able to get into a, a server and talk with people where now mm. it's, it's so it's, I mean, it's, it's not novel anymore. Like, Oh, well, you can have voice chat. I think that so many people are don't play with it anymore. That is a really different kind of experience. And now with YouTubers and making content and it's so easy to, you know, share your stuff that games are quite different. And so I think even with the way they did Battlefield 4, if people are actually doing objectives pretty often, like it's not it's not as squirrely as it was in Battlefield 4. Where it was like you had no idea what people were doing, didn't know where to go. <laughs> people didn't do any of the objectives. So it was just you you'd jump into a game and because people had server choice. And here's the difference between playing on a console and a PC is when you're on a console, you're stuck in that match. So unless you want to get out, which means another 30 seconds of loading a game because consoles are slower that in a way was kind of a good thing because people wouldn't leave a match. Even if they were losing, they would generally stay <laughs> and play, but on PC it's kind of like, Oh, I could just chop into another server really quick here. All of a sudden you lost 10 guys because you were losing for 10 minutes. And then you're like, well, damn it. <laughs> That's how I well, feel. Okay, so I hope, so hope that doesn't happen as much. Yeah, not to get off on a server browser tangent, but yeah, I'll agree that PC gaming is, has changed and it's not as easy to create a community around just having a server like it used to be. Like it used to be, you know, uh, in, in Battlefield, um, oh man, what was this? There was like, it was one, you know, virtual company that had, they had a server for every Battlefield game that was out. And mm -hmm. you could always go to their servers for like, it was like the 21st Realism Division Battlefield. Like, you always knew, same guys, it was going to be a good time, playing the objective. That's harder to find these days. 
Um, and I, I think that, yeah, for anything official matchmaking wise, those should be culled from the official servers only. I think the ideal scenario is have matchmaking, have it be an option and have a server browser where you kind of segregate the, the different content. Let people who just want to play the game, the vanilla game, get to it quickly without even thinking about it. And people who want to kind of spin off from that, they have the option off to the side. It should always be the the optional option, not yeah. not something that like gets thrown in your face where you're like, I want to play Battlefield 4. Look, all of the servers are instant vehicle respawn. Cool. <laughs> that was my nightmare. Yeah, ho hopefully it doesn't get that. And hopefully because the game is so popular. I mean, again, on Battlefront, there was like nobody playing on a PC compared to like everyone playing on PS4, you know, but like. Because this game is so successful so far and people really seem to be liking it, I don't think we'll have a problem, at least for a very long time. So that's that's good to know. I'm I, I'm never for like get rid of people's options. For me, it's just always I think because people are so easy to like, oh well I'm losing, I want to win. It's like for me, it's like I'll take the loss. I just want to keep playing. Like, but now because everyone lost, like now you can't even really play a game. So I've always hated when that happens. Um, so I just hope that doesn't happen in this where it's like every freaking server you get into. It's like, oh, well, we already joined. It's already lost. So we, we got to switch. It's like, man, I, I just spent a minute loading. <laughs> Can I, I want to play. <laughs> All right. Bugs and glitches. So it's had a pretty good launch as far as Battlefield games go, especially considering the Internet got DDoSed uh, in this large portion of the country the day it came out. But it's not perfect. So what doesn't work correctly? Besides not being able to join your friends reliably without using the the origin outside of the game to join. I can go over this pretty quick. I think I've got it kind of a, a, <laughs> a quick list. Uh, if you join off of a friend and it does work and you get into the game, but their squad's full, you're put into an empty squad that you cannot leave or see. And no one else can join it. And you're stuck in that squad until someone leaves your friend's squad. Or you can restart the game. Um... There's a couple of balance issues, some falling through map stuff. It, pretty minor, I think, bug-wise. Um, I actually wanted to mention kind of under this category that because the bugs aren't too bad, it, it's partially because DICE made what was probably the, the correct decision to kind of cull some stuff that's going to come out next month to get the game out in a pretty polished state. We don't have private servers or spectator mode or a couple of the custom modes like hardcore... Uh, the fog of war mode all that stuff is kind of in this weird like not dlc not new content it's going to get patched in later realm which isn't great like it's stuff that i i want to get my hands on i've been trying to figure out how to get into spectator mode for like a week and i realized oh it's not even in the game yet oh well that's lame but at the end of the day a more stable core feature set is probably it is the right decision um, I just wish that they were more clear about what was going to be added on, like in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. Joel, have you noticed any other bugs? Um, the campaign is riddled with bugs. Really, like, I haven't had actually seen any. Yeah, I've had tanks just like they like get stuck on like a, a tree and just sit there for a while. And like, I mean, yeah, I mean, there it, it's not very, it's not like. There is a, a huge level of polish, but then like a micro detail of polish of like animations, things like that. There's a lot of like wonky things here. People glitching through stuff. The cutscenes being desynced with the audio track. You can't controlling, you know, you know, tanks and stuff. You get in them, you got to tab out, do weird, funky stuff like that. Oh, yeah. But honestly, like I don't even just just erase what I said. Just Battlefield, just keep being good. Just stay where it is. Don't get worse. Just stay where it is and be awesome. Uh, what do you guys think about the campaign? Um, I'm giving it so. an 8.0 right now. Um, I have, I'll just say like, I, I'm, I can play pretty crappy single player games and really enjoy them. Like there's like most of the time, like a lot of people have like, who see lots of bugs and like that, like is a huge problem to them or whatever. For me, like, I, I feel like I don't notice that. Like I love Call of Duty campaigns every year. I love playing them. They're just a blast there's something i just it's like my own game i get to play for a little bit at a piece and they're like i fly through it in three hours i'm like i like play these things in 11 hours i don't know what the hell people are doing but like for me i'm i think i'm i think because battlefield one is a little bit like star wars for me i'm gonna be honest like because i love the, like world war two history or world war one history i mean and all that kind of stuff and the settle like just the, how it looks and everything 
I kind of have rose tinted glasses and I'm just mm. enjoying it for what it is. So I'm not really looking out for stuff. I mean, already in some of the campaigns, I already know what's going on. Like I'm being sneaky when I really don't have to. I'm playing on hard and it's super easy, but I'm just yeah, yeah. enjoying being immersed, taking it slow and just enjoying the environment. Like, again, it's like the only thing bad about all Battlefield single player campaigns is they just literally reuse their, their multiplayer maps and just kind of update them a little bit. Um, so I, I always think that's like not amazing just because most people play bat like multiplayer for a little bit and they come over and like, Ex Oh, exactly. I've already been through it. That, yeah. But saying that I'm still really enjoying it and I'm going to give it an 8.0 because the last one was just, I hated it. And then battlefield threes was pretty crappy and <laughs> I don't even know anything about hardline, but I'm just enjoying it. Like it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a solid, it's a solid single player campaign. I like that they didn't try to blow us away with all the destruction and everything else. And they instead, the idea of telling us stories, you know, it's a little bit more like watch all these cut scenes and occasionally do stuff than most shooter <laughs> campaigns are. So, you know, I don't think it's going to be for everyone. And if I had bought the game just to play the campaign, I think I'd probably be dis disappointed because as far as a big meaty single player experience goes, it's not that, but I enjoyed battlefield three and battlefield four's campaigns pretty well. Um, I really like the idea behind this, that it's just telling you some history and showing you different parts of the war that a lot of people probably aren't familiar with. I mean, how much do people really know about World War One? Dave and I were both not super up on it until the last couple of years. We've learned so much about it. Yeah. And I think it's so much more interesting than I used to because I didn't know anything about it. And I'm willing to bet that a lot of people don't know that fighting took place in all these different countries and all these different people were involved. So on that level, I think it's really, really interesting does part of me hope that there'll be another story added when the French DLC comes out and they add a French section? Yeah, that'd be really cool. Is that going to happen? Probably not. But uh, I think it's good. You know, it, it's a fun one-time experience that shows you a little bit more about the war, provides context, maybe teaches you a tiny bit of history, and has some good cutscenes. You know, that's basically it. It's a little, it's popcorny, but I appreciate they didn't try to go nuts with it and they, they had a little reservation. That said, that opening section, that 10, oh, 15 man. minute opening section, that is one of the better video game openers uh, I've ever seen. Oh, I forgot I, to add one thing on sound and music is Dave knows I have Spotify open in the background oh, and I play Lawrence of Arabia mixed with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade music all the time I'm playing. That's the music I play. I don't like the in-game music that much, so I just play that. But I'm playing the Lawrence of Arabia uh, campaign, and it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Jeremiah, that, that introduction section, like, I was annoyed at first that some of my 10 hours back in the early trial were going to go to, like, a single player thing. So I was like, oh, I want to save single player. And then it started, and I was like, nope, I'm good. I'm here. Let's do it. Um, fantastic intro. Unfortunately, I started t the two weakest campaigns in the single player from what I've heard from other people first so i got a pretty poor first impression i talked about it last week um i got plane rammed literally nine times in a row in the plane section i might turn down the difficulty it might be like a glitch with the ai but i was like what is this like a troll server i'm playing or something that everyone's just ramming me maybe because i was turning really tight i can't too. wait to play that to find out what you did dave to find out like oh dave was just being so immersed <laughs> I, actually i think I think the problem is I have that key bonnie on the keyboard to make a 100% tight turn. And I think the AI can't handle that. And they just hit me when I start making that turn over and over again. I think that's probably where I'm going wrong. But uh, yeah, the, the plane one was visually stunning, but that, that was annoying. I'm going to go back to that one. And then I did the campaign, the Italian one, the first mission for that, where you're literally just wearing a suit of armor and carrying a giant machine gun and you're, a, you're an invincible tank. And that goes on for like 30 minutes. And I, was, I got really bored of that by the end. And it's the, that section of that campaign is the exact Monte Grappa map from multiplayer. Like it's, it's a hundred percent duplicated, like no changes to it whatsoever. And so that, that was too familiar and the gameplay wasn't great. It was just waves of bad guys too. But at Joel's suggestion before tonight, I've played like, the first two complete sections of Mud and Blood, the tank mission with the British Mark V tank in um, eastern France as Germany is getting pushed back at the end of the war. That is incredible. It's linear, but the way you can just take the tank and like go through part of a village, literally through part of the village. I was like flanking defenses. And I was like, wow, the campaigns actually let me pick routes a little bit. And the did you play it? Are you playing on hard at all, Dave? Of course, of course, nice. yeah. Um, 
it, yeah, I'm, I'm with Joel too. Like, I'm playing on super hard. So I, I die in dumb ways sometimes, just because it's like it's on super hard. Like if you make a mistake, it's like, well, I'm caught in the open. Restart. <laughs> uh, I'm dead. <laughs> but uh, most of the time, it's a good balance. And well, it's not really challenging. It's definitely fun. And I'm. I think my my final thoughts on single player are while I think they're still suffering from some design issues where they're having a hard time getting past the waves of respawning enemies at times. And I'd love to see some more. I don't know, like, Day of Defeat-style damage model in single-player. Like, I know it wouldn't translate very well to multiplayer, because it'd be like, like playing hardcore mode and then going to easy mode for multiplayer. But I think a, a, a more interesting damage model that gets away from multiplayer a bit would make the single-player more interesting, and they could stop doing just the non-stop respawning waves. But at the end of the day, I am very, very happy that DICE actually went for a more authentic single-player campaign that... Um, is those little snapshots of the war and they're actually talking about real battles and real events they have their little twist on them but it really feels authentic i think it's going to give people uh not only a, a fun campaign it's going to be a fun campaign but it's also a really neat look at history that a lot of people aren't very familiar with i'm, I'm so happy that they went for some of these different perspectives for the for the campaign it's awesome so people will probably be able to guess but uh overall value what do you guys think <laughs> 10 for me 10 okay i think it's very good i think uh if you've been away from battlefield for a while you might really enjoy this you should you know you should try a a, a demo or something just to be on the safe side especially if you were really burned by battlefield 4 and you're not ready to love again <laughs> yeah buy the five dollar origin axis for yeah, PC. yeah try it out yeah you have 10 hours of trial try that if you don't like it by then then you know it's it's not something for you but, yeah, but, you know, we, we were hard on DICE. I've been saying all along, I want to give them credit where credit is due. I think they did about as well as you could reasonably expect them to do on the next game. Like, I don't think they really could have made the game a ton better than this. Um, You know, I'd be very interested to see where they go from here, where they go with the DLC. There's a lot of room for them still to mess it up with patches in the future. Like, <laughs> it's an online game, so the next six months are just as important as it is right now. Uh, if we want people to actually keep playing it. Uh, but I think they, they did a really good job. So kudos to them. Uh, but for now, let's move on to the news. We're going to do a light. Sorry. I'm sorry. I cut you off, Joel. <laughs> it's in Anybody your contract. Anybody really, really want to play Battlefield right now? Like right uh, we'll, we'll get now. to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. So Heavy we're going to go breathing. We're going to go light on the news tonight. Uh, first thing, the GTX 1050 and 1050 Ti are out now. Benchmarks are out. And I am impressed. Dave, have you read any reviews? Uh, negative. To put this into context, the GTX 1050 Ti is a little bit faster than a GTX 680. It has four gigabytes of VRAM. Dave, it pulls 75 watts. It has a TDP of 75 watts all through the PCI slot. It's a light bulb. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's between. It's a little bit better than a GTX 770. It's between a GTX 960 and 970 in performance. Closer to the 960 than the 970, but still. With a, a MSRP of 140 bucks, that's pretty amazing. Now it's yeah. not as fast as the RX 470, which AMD just dropped the price on. So th theoretically, that can be had for 170 now. So we're we're in for a fun ride. But the RX 460 is pretty much a dead card because the GTX 1050 is a little bit faster and the same price uh, and uses a lot less power. And the GTX 1050 Ti is faster, just a little bit more expensive, and uses the same amount of power. So I'm nice. interested to see what aftermarket boards can do with overclocking, because it's possible we could see some really ridiculous numbers. As cool as the cards are and as little powers they use, there's a lot of theoretical potential there. But good job, NVIDIA. Uh, next, Dave, what do you got for us? The PS4, and this got my attention, despite being about the PS4, the PS4 is getting an official uh, mouse and keyboard. Um, it's going to be designed by, who is this? Tac Pro. That's, that's the name of the, um, oh. I don't know who makes this, honestly. Okay, first of all, in the time-honored tradition of PC-related things having awful names, whatever company's making this thing has named it the Tactical Assault Commander Pro. <laughs> Tac Pro for short, which is just, what an awful name. Um... <laughs> It's like a little mini keyboard. You got your WASD and some side keys, and uh, then it's a, got a little else. controller analog stick too. Oh yeah, I totally yep. missed that. That's little... that's really cool. I think. Yeah. Um. 
overall, it's it looks pretty neat. I think honestly, the mouse looks a little bit cheap. It looks like a Microsoft mouse from like twenty years. ago. It looks ago. like you can use your own mouse if you want. You can plug it in. What? Yep. I got boxes of my son. <laughs> boxes. <laughs> um. Yeah. It's it's a little pricey, one hundred and fifty bucks, but um, it appears this is actually going to be supported by the PS4. Like no like controller emulation or weird stuff going on. This is actual mouse and keyboard support. This might be a must have for me for Battlefront with Joel uh, at some point. Exciting news. Um, I'm liking this whole consoles are just one big happy family with PCs now. They share games, they share controllers, they share now mouse and keyboard. What's next? They share game keys, maybe? Uh, uh. Swappable <laughs> graphics cards, blue screen of death swapping. <laughs> Windows 10 for already, everyone. <laughs> Joel, there already is a PlayStation blue screen of death. It's the, we need to update the PlayStation software before you can use any online features. No! Like, That's no, funny. I've, I've, I've actually never seen that because it auto-updates for me. Mm -mm. Mine's supposed it, it to. Because it knows I'm a PS Plus member. A gold tier member. <laughs> I am also I a member. I buy multiple games of the same thing. I am also a member and you're just mine is still sucking right. up yeah that's probably what it is that's probably anyway. what it is uh next bit of news <laughs> so nintendo's sales are down um overall profit rises but their sales decrease this is so sad um the wii u sold 53 percent fewer units in the past year than the year before it sold 560,000 units and sold 8.3 million software units. Nintendo puts the ladder down to there being, quote, no hit titles this period to compare with Splatoon and Super Mario Maker last year. That's how much they've given up on this console. Uh. There weren't any hit games for it this year. That's so sad. That's, That's so horrible. sad. I know. I... Anyway, so let's talk about the Nintendo Switch, which was announced right after we recorded our podcast last week. Um, it's If anyone hasn't seen it, it's pretty much a tablet with two little controller things that click onto the sides. Apparently, you and all your trendy hipster friends can play with it on rooftops, in competitive gaming leagues, on a 6.2-inch <laughs> screen, a uh, variety of other things. You can plug it into your TV if you want to see tablet graphics on a large screen. You can also do that. It's going to be great, I'm sure. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? That you apparently hate it. No, I don't. I don't. But <laughs> I was. Well, I, what, what a dick move on a six point two inch screen, Joel. What do you want? Like holding a massive, like fifty inch tablet. Come on, oh, Joel. This is my backpack. Six point two inches. Okay, guys, let's go play a LAN party. Let me bring my giant PC. Joel, you, you, you gotta, uh, uh, Joel. Joel, be nice. You gotta understand from Jeremiah's perspective. Yeah. It is so inches. small. <laughs> it's, it's, it's only it's, half the size of his phone, okay? It's not that much bigger than my phone. It's a problem. <laughs> no, no, Joel, the difference is you watch and you're like, oh, a new gaming thing I can buy? I don't even care. I'm in. I'm in. No, I'm in. No, look no. at that video. <laughs> Great generalization. No, I look at... That looks like an awesome screen. Joy and I both watched and we're like, this would be so much fun on vacations and stuff like that, sitting in bed and knowing that you can pull the controllers off, put the screen down and not have to hold it like this above your head. You can have it setting. The controller you pull off is this big and the joystick. Again, your thumbs you're are. this big. <laughs> we're just like, oh, these are controllers regular size. These are great. It's not regular size. It's like two inches wide. It's not two inches. Three and a half, maybe. There you go. <laughs> I think... I it's the best thing Nintendo could have done right now. It really is. Because they cannot compete with consoles right now at all. They just can't. Unless they went right nuts, now being, again, the la being the last like 15 yeah, years. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I mean I'm I'm still waiting to see like what are they gonna be able to run on this thing? You know yeah, I mean? That again, even looking at how the PS4 is slim, how much smaller it is now, like every year it's crazy how technology can get smaller and smaller and do amazing things. Our phones are getting incredible, you know. But for me looking at it going, this actually looks awesome because yeah, I can just quickly pop it in, play it. Like I, what I hated about the Wii U gamepad is I can't actually play from upstairs. Like the the Wi-Fi thing, will it doesn't connect to Wi-Fi. It actually sends its own signal, mm -hmm. so I could not play a game from there. It was just out of reach. So I was like, ah, oh, crap. That was actually the times that I did want to play it. Um, and then the screen was really bad. This looks like it's like a like a regular iPad like screen, you know, a certain size, but 
What I loved is in the commercial, you pop it in there and you could use a regular, it looked like they had a regular Xbox 360 type controller so I can get one for me and Joy. Not one of us has a weird game pad. The other has to have like a <laughs> funky off-brand one or a slightly different. It's like you're on the same level as everyone else. That's what I hated about the game pad. And this is what I'm excited about. This is like, this is cool because I'm like, man, bring it to the beach, like playing some Super Mario with Joy or whoever, like, hey, hop in. Here's an extra controller. Like, that sounds like a lot of fun. It's it's bringing the both the worlds of Nintendo DS, which was a phenomenal system. Like no one can deny that thing was mm -hmm. amazing. It sold incredibly well and has some awesome games on it. But now they can focus on guess what? You can play every mobile type game and every console type game all in the same system. I think it's awesome. So if it works, that's going to be cool. So hopefully it's not like, you know, what we're seeing is like nowhere near to what it can do, <laughs> you know. So but we'll see. I think it was a great idea. I can't wait. I can't wait to see it. I think it's an interesting idea, just to clarify, but uh, I just have a lot of doubt that Nintendo is going to pull it off for the same reasons that they've been struggling for the past 10, 15 years. Oh, They're sure. talking a big game about lots, all these publishers they've got lined up or all these developers they've got lined up. They're talking a big game about how you're going to play with all your friends and stuff, but they just reported that... <laughs> They had their sales went down this past year because they didn't have any hit games released <laughs> on their platform, which they control and own all the IP for. Uh, they're like, they're, hold, they're holding them back for next year. They're absolutely doing that. Probably, but I'm saying like I, that's why the same reason I'm very skeptical of PSVR because Sony in the past, even if they make a good thing, if it doesn't immediately take off, they've had and it looks like PSVR has taken off, so that's good. Oh but yeah, very. Sony much so. Sony has had a tendency to just ship it out to die, like. Oh well, yeah. we tried, and like they don't, they don't stick to it. And Nintendo has kind of done the same thing, where they're like, "Well, I mean, we're gonna put out Smash Brothers and a bunch of Mario games and stuff, but oh well, we'll get them next time." And like, <laughs> that really sucks when it's like a four or five year long console life cycle. Like, next time's a long way away. So I yeah, think I the bought the Wii U hoping to play the new Zelda. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I guess it will come out for the Wii U. It will. Uh, but I'm not going to have, I'm not going to play like the it people who bought PS threes for final fantasy 15. Like mm. that was a mistake. <laughs> people who bought the, the, the new, uh, uh, what's that one game? That's actually finally coming out last guardian. <laughs> like they bought the PS three for it. Yeah. <laughs> like, 10 years. Oh man, that sucks. The dream is real. I forgot. I do actually have some sales stats on PSVR and I researched Oculus okay. and Vive. If anything, this is awesome. Hopeful news for VR in general. The Vive, which came out in April, has sold roughly 140,000 units. Mm -hmm. um, Oculus is a little less than that. It's about 110-ish. Like, um, it's not doing as well as the Vive. Um, the PlayStation VR in Japan in one week sold 50,000 units. Already, like, almost already catching up to it. So we don't, I don't know that there's no, uh, there's no sales numbers. I think November 1st, we might find out what they've sold in the U.S. Nice. But every GameStop has said they've sold way more than they thought they ever were going to. So they're all restocking. They're all sold out. Um, so that's exciting. That's cool. So yeah. like if, if it's already caught up in one week to them, <laughs> they've, they've been out for five or six months. That's exciting for VR in general because that means more developers are going to make more games. And that means more people's pants are going to be crapped in. <laughs> Speaking of good for VR overall, at Microsoft's press conference, which is honestly one of the best Microsoft conferences, it wasn't a gaming related one, but just one of the best conferences they've ever done. Um, like as far as interesting new things they showed off, I think they did way better than Apple. Of course, I don't like Apple that much, but I don't honestly love Microsoft that much, but I was very impressed. By I'm a lot less of things biased. They showed off. I enjoyed the Microsoft conference, but uh, they're were, they were both very good. I think Microsoft showed off more innovation at their conference. I, uh, I love their, yeah, their new iMac thing is awesome. That, that studio, the new iMac. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's essentially, the new iMac it's, thing is so it's innovative. Their, come on. Don't. It's a Cintiq. It's a Cintiq on a stand is what it is. No, but it's like, a Wacom it, Cintiq. It's like, it's like they're creating their, their, that model uh, of like a, a PC. And I think it's awesome that they're doing that style. I think anyway, they should anyway, be doing that a long time Sorry, ago. that wasn't the point I was going with. Uh, they announced they're going to be releasing some actual VR headsets starting at $300. They're partnering with a couple different vendors, but they're officially coming from Microsoft. Here's what's cool, Joel. Uh, some of them are going to have internal tracking. No camera, no special setup. You just put the headset on and it can track it. If that's good... That could be really awesome. So no one has confirmed yet if there's going to be any gaming applications for these, although I'd be very surprised if Scorpio doesn't have support for this. Uh, but if this can support the Steam VR standard, this could be the actual first truly open VR headset that's affordable for PC, which would be amazing. <coughs> I'm still putting some eggs in the basket that PSVR is going to get official PC support or it's going to get cracked and get unofficial support like the DualShock 4. Uh, but if that doesn't work out, I'm actually a little bit interested in this now. This could be pretty cool. So 
Uh, our last bit of news tonight, Red Dead Redemption 2. It's confirmed it's coming for at least PS4 and Xbox One, presumably PC as well. They haven't announced that yet. It is coming holiday of 2017 until it gets delayed till spring of 2018. <laughs> what do you guys think based off the tiny little nothing that we know about it? It looks pretty. I mean, it looks That's amazing. all I can say. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be good. I mean, if if we can take anything from GTA 5's multiplayer, like what you can do in that, oh, Old West. And even with, I've been watching Westworld, so I'm like, Ooh. dude, it's the perfect time right now for Red Dead. That show is doing well, and it's going to probably come out around the same time as Westworld Season 2's, like, mid-season or something. So cool. <laughs> it's kind of a perfect time. Uh, Joel, do you have a 90 seconds this week? Um, I mean, I always got another page. No, we'll skip it this week for time. We'll skip yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, let's skip that for time. The, the people it's aren't for ready. for sanity. <laughs> the people aren't ready. You can write into <laughs> casual shenanigans at gmail.com, just like Quantum did. Quantum of Infinity wrote back with a shorter version of his essay from last week, and he says, Hello, essay writer here. Yes, I have a tendency to write big messages. I guess I wanted to go too much into details. Ignore my last serenade. And instead, I'll try to make a short <laughs> message now. Uh, I guess I wanted to make 180 seconds with Quantum. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to say this is writing in in regards to our topic about bad game launches he said my favorite game Elite Dangerous had a catastrophic launch of patch 2.1 it introduced amazing features but they were absolutely obliterated by bugs and bad design the AI was almost impossible to kill also they could make illegal combinations of weapons like a machine shotgun plasma cannon with aim assist in short plasma cannons have no aim assist as an option and is equivalent here of a heavy sniper rifle fully automatic massacre Engineers introduced it in this patch and, and had impossible blueprint requirements and finding materials for them were most, mostly randomized. And if you even had those materials, effects were randomized too, so there was no guarantee you would get a good upgrade. Now it is fixed mostly and is very enjoyable to play again, but many people left the game after 2.1 or they were angry. Now they listen to the community much better and it shows, I guess we can call it a recovery. Quantum. Thanks for writing in, Quantum. Yeah, that, that's a game that definitely has gone through a lot of patches because they rushed it out. To get it beat Star Citizen, which turns out they could have taken their time, but they rushed it out to try to beat Star Citizen, <laughs> uh, and then it had it had a bit of a rough launch and it's had some rough times. But the people in our group who play it seem to really enjoy it, so good for them. But now, Dave, yes, it's time for comment of the week. Where Ooh. is that the real Dave Evil Viking Thirteen wins the next Fallout video? Digs deep into his comment section, cries, drinks a little bit, and reads you whatever he's been laughing about today. Dave, what you got for us? And this week. <laughs> by digging deep, you mean I opened the front page of the comments page. <laughs> the first page is all it took. We got a couple golden ones for you this week. Uh, first off, a reply to my reply to a different comment. It is an honor to talk to your highness. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, Someone asked you know, in one of my videos where he can find more content like it besides just my channel. Always a good answer. You like X thing? Who else makes X thing? Someone replied... And I'll censor the guy's name here, because this is probably one of the most backstabbing compliments I've seen in a while. If you like this, go check out other YouTuber on YouTube. He has a <laughs> he has average videos and doesn't post often, but go check him out. <laughs> if you want a super average time, we got a guy. Like, go check this guy out. It's not great. That doesn't pose very often. Not very good, actually. Now that I think about it, don't bother. Like, I don't know where that comment was going. It's like he was writing it as he thought. Um, and this final comment was on a Fallout settlement. I about fell out of my chair laughing when this one came in. This is amazing. Everyone should have a friend like Joel who sits next to them taking rapt interest in all their boring hobbies, <laughs> telling them how <laughs> brilliant it all is and how wonderfully <laughs> clever they are, laughing at every joke. <laughs> yep, we should all be so lucky to have a friend like Joel. <laughs> what you guys don't know is that's just how Joel is. For his birthday, he made a mousetrap game out of a cardboard box. This was his 31st birthday. <laughs> And nobody was like, that's kind of weird. Everybody was like, oh, sweet. Joel's got a new idea. <laughs> and we played it for like two hours. <laughs> it was pretty fun. I want jo a box of LaCroix. <laughs> Joel and his wife make pillow forts in their living room sometime. Joel is basically going to be 15 for the rest of his life. <laughs> It'll be successful director Joel wearing his Boba Fett t-shirt for the Boston <laughs> <and> kids. <laughs> 
<laughs> yep. While still sleeping with a bear every night. I don't know if he does that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, everybody should have a friend. There like ain't nothing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we can't sing that on the air. <laughs> Depends on which version. Yeah. Mm. 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 What are you Dave, drinking, Dave? Is that a Star Wars cup? I got a Star Wars bag for Christmas from, from the wife. Ooh. This is, in fact, a Star Wars cup. Ooh. Uh, is it a paper cup that you've just been drinking out of this whole time? Or is that like a plastic? <laughs> no, it's, it's plastic. It's okay, I didn't know if that was like a it. Taco Bell cup you've just been nursing for the past like 11 months. <laughs> oh, it's like, it's got this weird like blackish green ring like around the, the bottom of it. But yeah, that's just, like flavor. That's the flavor at the bottom. Well, just to keep it from being too much flavor, I scrape it out like once a week and then it just it comes back by itself. Mm, sounds good. Sounds good. With that, guys, that's the show. <laughs> Thank you for coming out, watching Casual Shenanigans Gaming Podcast, or listening if you listen to it. Always remember, you can check us out, youtube.com slash casual shenanigans, iTunes, Stitcher, other places I'm probably not aware of. But thank you for listening to us wherever you listen to us. Thank you for rating the podcast. Thank you for coming and hanging out. Usually Wednesdays in the chat, or it's now Wednesdays, used to be Thursdays, but it's Thursday again this week. Also, it could Joel's be Tuesday fault. next week. <laughs> also, Joel's fault again. <laughs> no, but uh, th th thank you, everybody, for coming out. <laughs> it's been great. We hope you enjoyed the topic. Leave a comment below with your thoughts of Battlefield. If you've encountered different bugs than us, if you had different experiences than us, if you really enjoy it, if you really hate it, whatever, we'd like to hear about it. Write into casual yeah. at gmail.com, tweet at casual shanaga, or leave a comment below. We'd love to talk to you about it. But until next week, guys. Stay casual.